everybody had a safe and uh, happy 4th of July. Uh, it's good to see everybody back. Um, let's all stand. We're actually going to start out with the Pledge of Allegiance. So let's all stand. We're going to do the Pledge of Allegiance. All right. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We're going to go over uh, to 633. We'll sing, My Eyes Have Seen the Glory. Oh. 
Good morning. Good morning. Uh, you go ahead and be seated. I'm going to uh, just be a second today. Our pastor uh, has sent me word this morning that he's already been to one service and preached at the campground that he's at. And uh, he was getting ready to go to a big service with everybody. And uh, he, But he's praying for you. And I know he's been praying a, a lot for, for this church. And it's, it's uh, like Paul said, uh, he listed all the things he went through. But he said, and above all that is the care of the church. As a pastor, he really does care uh, for you. And he said he loves you. And he's praying for you. Like he said, he goes down the seat where he used to sit because that's what he's got memorized. And he, and he, as he goes in his mind mentally, he prays for you. So you, he's, when he looked at you the other day, none of, nobody was sitting where they're usually set. So I know it's hard uh, to remember that. So our pastor sent word that he loves you. And he said, put money in the buckets. Uh, no, no. Uh, but uh, that's, that's a, I always joke with him that when he's not here, I'm going to preach on tithing. But he's not allowed me to do that. The Lord's not allowed me to do that yet. So I'm, I'm uh, sorry about that. Uh, not going to do it today. But. Uh, it is a great weekend, and I'm proud to be an American. I'm proud to stand uh, for the red, white, and blue. And we did, we opened with the Pledge of Allegiance because we are one nation under God, and we still enjoy the freedoms. I think it was Downey this morning was like, a, people are quick to diss America and how bad we are here, but they're, they're still enjoying America for what she is, uh, a land of the free. God has blessed this nation, and and as we are the remnant that needs to continue to pray for this nation and continue to pray that God would bless it. And, and uh, I've got just a few things here. Uh, the scripture is that I wanted to read this morning is actually, if the Son has, makes you free, then you are free indeed. And he said that when Israel was under Roman rule where they could take a man and crucify him on a cross. When he said that, that's what he was getting ready to do at that very moment, be crucified for our sins. So uh, Paul never had the freedoms that we have, but yet he was in prison when he wrote the letters to, to Philippians, Colossians, and Galatians, all the letters uh, that he wrote while he was in prison for preaching the gospel. And now we have the freedom to stand and preach the gospel. We get all worked up that they're making us wear masks or, or they're suggesting we wear masks. And You know, I've heard more things about these things right here lately. People complaining you have to wear them. People complaining you're not wearing them. People, really, guys? I mean, that's what we're complaining about in America right now. Uh, and uh, But, you know, we all have, we all, it's like the carpets in churches. You know what I'm saying? We all, we all think one way or the other. But that's what we're dealing with in America as if that's, the issue that's really getting us upset in America then we're living in a good place we're living in a great place God has blessed us that I could stand up and, and preach the word you could sit here and listen and we could sing these songs and worship him here today in spirit and in truth I want to just say a few words here from uh, this is church family thank you for the cards that you sent to me after my surgery Thank you very, very much. They're very much appreciated. Love you, John Oxford. So they, those mean a lot. And when you send them, and, and I'm not as good as that as I, I need to be. I, I'm horrible at, at, at correspondence, but uh, they do mean a lot. I, and I know I've been on the receiving end of those things. And, and, and uh, it helps the encouragement one to another. Church, we love you. And I could say that. Father God, we're gathered here this morning and Lord, you know our hearts. You know where we stand and, and right now where we're sitting, Father God, you know what is on our, our cares and, and the cares of this world may be drowning out some of what you want us to hear, Father God. I pray that you fertilize our hearts right now with your love. God, that you just wrap your arms around us, Lord, that that our hearts would be so receptive to what you would have us to say, what you would, what you want to, the message you want us to receive, Lord, that we would be receptive to your Holy Spirit, Lord God, that he would have his way here in our lives, Lord, 
That we can put all the cares of this world behind us, Lord, and focus on you. Look under your face, Lord, and just see that. And when we look into that, Lord, that all these things, Lord, when we seek you first, all these things, Lord God, are not will fade away, Lord. They're, they're not as important as, as, as seeing you, Lord. I pray that you be glorified in this place, Lord. Be lifted up. And if there's one that's lost and doesn't know you in our midst, Lord God, that this very day be the day of salvation. We love you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Brother Chris. All right, let's all stand once again. We're going to go over to 406. We'll sing the solid rock. Just the God of the love, a little sin. 
Thessalonians chapter 4 is where I'm going to begin today. And we've been hearing a lot about it in the news, uh, even people talking just uh, on Facebook. Uh, is this the end? Are we here? Uh, somebody said the other day we're already 70 weeks into the rapture <laughs> or into the tribulation. And I said, no, we're not. We're not. Uh, and and uh, but uh, it, it does look more and more. I saw one Christian publisher or, or Christian uh, speaker put that, you know, is this kind of the reverse rapture of what was supposed to take place? But I want to talk just a little bit about the rapture of God's church. Our next event that is heading, uh, that, that's the next thing on the calendar to be fulfilled. Now, when is it? Uh, well, we're to always be ready. Matter of fact, Paul said be ready uh, when he was here. So uh, it could happen because, uh, and we're going to look at, at any moment. Uh, we don't know the day or the hour, but we can know the seasons. And I talked a little bit, I guess on a Wednesday night, I brought a message that uh, about uh, is this the end times. And, and now I just, I just want to kind of narrow in a little bit and, and look and talk about the rapture of the church. I I've never actually preached on this, so this is actually my first time. Pre I've taught in Sunday school and that kind of thing, but this is my first first go. So, uh, church, I'm, I'm glad to be here with you and bringing the message. And I know Pastor Bobby wants to be here. His heart is here, and uh, but uh, if if you've seen him the last few days, he needs to get a break. And I told him just don't come, just relax, and and uh, he needs to wind down. Being in the business he's in, and or, or what his job is, and, and uh, here too, I, he needs just to come back refreshed, and hopefully that's what's happening. But right here, if we get to have another service, because uh, we may be having one in there, uh, if you're left behind, you, the doors, you could get wherever you find my pants. You could there's keys in there. Uh, you could come and unlock the door. If you, I hope no one's left in here. But uh, you will have at least the layout where we went because I'm going to tell you right here. Uh, if you understand that, the raptures occur. Uh, there's key, and if you need in this building, but I'd say the people that are left behind won't want to come in here uh, because uh, they haven't yet. So, First Thessalonians chapter four, verse thirteen, guys. I'm, uh, this is this is uh, one of those things, and I think Caleb's going to have this on the board here, and it, it's it's uh, it. In verse number 13, it says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Paul says that a few times in, in his scripture. I don't want you to be ignorant about these things. He tells them, he goes, I don't want you to be ignorant about the gifts. I don't want you to be ignorant. Here he is saying, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. So here's Paul saying to the Thessalonian church, he had to write to them because he had been there preaching and he was he brought the message and he's told them these things many a times, but yet other people came and like they were 
writing letters saying that they were Paul. And they were like writing these letters of, of, of apostasy. And he's going to talk about that in just a second. Tell them that they've already missed the rapture. That would be disheartening. To think that you've already missed the rapture, that it's already occurred, and you missed it. Well, that's what he was writing to these people. And, uh, and he's going he's gonna to write a second Thessalonians just about a couple of weeks later to go back and fix the things that other people say had already happened. Jesus has already come back. So, so here he's in 1 Thessalonians 4.13. It says, Brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. And, and if, if you read 1 Thessalonians, it's a rich book. In every single chapter it talks about Jesus coming back. So, so that's what 1 Thessalonians, all five chapters. Uh, so it says, For if we believe that Jesus died not, and rose again, even so them also which sleep, there we go, I can see it a lot better, in Jesus will, will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not pre prevent them which are asleep. For so those that are dead, that, here's what they were hearing: that those that are dead have to, will not will not be raptured if you die before them. They'd have to wait. And they, or, so they're getting basically he's clearing up some theology here with them. It says this in verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall, ever, so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then this verse right here, verse 18. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Church, I want to comfort you with these words. I want to bring comfort to you. Uh, I heard a preacher say, you know, what a preacher's job is, is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. <laughs> Sometimes in church we get too comfortable and basically needs to prod or to take the hook and bring you back and, and sometimes that, that's, that's what we do but I want to comfort you here this morning the words that I say I'm, I'm, my, my purpose is to bring comfort towards you uh, so, so comfort you one another with these sayings and what does it say there let's go back and let's look here in verse 17 then we which are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, unless you're reading a Latin translation, the word rapture is not mentioned anywhere in the Bible. But the Bible was in Latin at one point, and that's where the doctrine of rapture comes because it's this verse right here, the called up, being called up. Matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, We'll go there. I have it, and I just want to read uh, real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. It says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. Uh, guys, I don't know, but that's actually a good verse to put in the nursery uh, because they're not all going to sleep, and they shall be changed. So that we may have to do that, put that verse down there for them. But uh, anyway, we're not all going to sleep. We're not all going to die. And I praise the Lord. To glory be to God. I hope I would love to be one of. Them. I would love for everyone in this room to not have to go that way. But but uh, but uh, it's a, and we could very well because the stage is set uh, for that. We could be that. I mean, it could before I finish this message. And some of you are like praise the Lord. I don't want to hear it all. But uh, but anyway, it could happen before I finish this message. Uh, so and I believe that. But. Uh, Anyway, it says, we shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, and here's what it says, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and the mortal must put on immortality. 
mentality. But see, here's what it says. It says, and we shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye. John even or, writes about this when, when in ch chapter 14 when Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, and where I am you may also be. He's going to come and get us. Second Thessalonians was written just, just a few weeks after this. And, and I want to go to a verse here in 2 Thessalonians. As a matter of fact, I'm just going to, this is where I'm going to park just for a few minutes in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Uh, and, and there's a, a lot of things I could bring out this morning, and, and it, we could go weeks on just talking about the rapture if you really wanted to. But, but uh, I'm going to cover just a few verses and just a few things to why I believe this. Well, I think Scripture shows, and, and I know there's theologians that say otherwise, but I, I just can't, I'm not convinced, and this is what, uh, I, I agree, pastor agrees the same way I do on this teaching, but, and I know there's probably some in this church that may differ, uh, but uh, I want to show you what God's Word says, and we can look and see and maybe uh, show you why I think it's a, the rapture will occur before the, pre, the tribulation. It's called a pre-tribulation rapture. Now, there's also a post-tribulation rapture that thinks that the church will go through the tribulation and then rapture it out at the end. Then there's also a mid-tribulation rapture that, that it will happen in the middle. And there's also another rapture that occurs just, uh, and it's also a mid-tribulation rapture as well. So they, they think there's, those views are out there, okay? So I, I want to show you why it, uh, Scripture points to a pre-tribulation rapture. And uh, let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1. And I want to look here just a second. It says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not so shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by the Spirit, nor by the Word, nor by letter as from us as that day of Christ is at hand. or as Now, here, real quick, Kayla, I want you to show, this is one, now, I, I, I was raised on King James, but King James actually doesn't have that, that right. Uh, you're like, huh? What? King James don't have it right? Coach Kidd, trust me, I would have been the first to, to object to that. But I want you to look at, can you pull up NIV right there? Uh, now look at that. They said the Lord coming of the Lord is at hand, but it says at the very end there, by, by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. Because that's a past tense use of the word there. And they said, don't think that the coming of the Lord has already come. You didn't miss the trip. You didn't miss the rapture. So here was a church that was sitting there thinking, oh no, we missed it. Jesus has came and we're done. They were thinking that he came and, and it, everything's over because they were going through the midst of persecution. They were being fed to the lions. They were being burned at the stake. Those kind of things were happening to these, this church and they thought they had already missed it. This is the midst of the tribulation. They thought that they, they already missed the coming of the Lord. So it goes on here. Go back to the King James. That's what I'll be reading here. It says, Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there be a falling away, there come a falling away first. And the man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. So, okay, the rapture and then the coming of the son of man are two different things. You know that? The rapture is going to take place before the Antichrist. Now here's the thing. Look here. It says that there will be a falling of what of a, away first. That falling away. Some people even translate that that's pulling away of the church in the rapture. But I don't think that. It says it, because it doesn't add up to the rest of Scripture. It says the falling of the way first. Now, if you look at the world, there's been a falling away from the truth. Uh, matter of fact, if you look just a some of you in this church used to go to a public school that had prayer in school. How many of you remember prayer in school when you were in school? Look at that. A lot of hands right here. A lot of hands are raised. 
There used to be prayer in school. There used to be a posting of the Ten Commandments on the wall in every school. There used to be a posting on the Ten Commandments in courthouses. And uh, my Meemaw was saved at school. She was led to the Lord, and they had, they had school, and they had a revival at school. And, and, and in school. Right over here, she lived in Carter's Creek at Townsend. And that's just over the mountain there. And I know here it was kind of the same kind of things. I don't know if you were, but but she was saved at school. And she was telling me that story. But, you know, until 1962, which was a relatively short time, prayer was allowed in public schools. Matter of fact, that's why we started schools in, in, the, in America. And I want to talk just a second about that. We started schools to train people how to read the Bible. We started schools to train. Matter of fact, Harvard was started to train preachers to go out and preach the Word of God. Hard, a little different from that today. But that's what it was started for. There has been a falling away from God's Word. The falling away from the truth. Matter of fact, the Bible even says that people are willingly ignorant. He tells us not to be ignorant, brethren. But we're willingly ignorant. In, the, in America, the world is willingly ignorant. 1962, prayer was banned from school. 1980, the Ten Commandments were banned. They had to be taken down. And you know, 19, there was no, no school shootings in the 1960s or before that. No massive shoot, school shootings <coughs> occurred. After the Ten Commandments were taken down, they were like every other year. And so... So think about that, because now we had on the wall, thou shalt not kill, but that's taken down because it offends people. We're super sensitive. Now, I'm telling you, as Americans, so I'll probably be banned on Facebook because I'm saying these kind of things, but hey, that's okay. We'll watch it on YouTube. But uh, listen, guys, I, I'm, I'm, we are in a time where we're post, a post-Christian society. Even though 94% of Americans believe or say they believe in, in the Word of God, they say they believe in God, and, and, uh, but it's, it doesn't look like that. Uh, we're in a post-Bible society. Matter of fact, today, a lot of people consider the word, this book right here, is hate speech. You, re you read out certain verses from this book, you're consider that's considered hate speech if you say that. On college campuses and universities, this book is, is considered divisive, and you shouldn't say that because they think in, in what's called universalism. Uh, but uh, there has been a dramatic, ri a dramatic rise in atheism around this world. So that's apostasy in the world, but guess what? There's also apostasy in the church. You go to other denominations and, and other churches. Matter of fact, Matthew chapter 25 talks about this. The ten virgins. Uh, we're, we're <laughs> anyway, uh, the ten virgins. Uh, uh, so, and I'm going to say this, half of them don't have the oil in their lamp when the Christ comes. They're, they're identifying with them, with the virgins. They're identifying with them, but when the, the bridegroom comes, they don't have the oil in their lamps. And what is the oil type of? It's a type of the Holy Spirit. So that means they're not genuine believers. They're not, they don't believe that Jesus is the Lord and Savior. They've not accepted Him as their, their Savior. They're not saved. So there's half of, and there's half of this, of the church, what claims to be Christians. I would say, Jesus says it in Matthew 25, there's probably half that claim to be Christians that aren't saved. They identify, they park in the garage, but that don't make them a car. They sit in the church, but that don't make them a Christian. They identify with it, but they don't believe. They're not. And I can't, I can't judge and say there may be some in this room right now that, that haven't ever trusted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. There may be. The, the odds are there probably aren't some. I pray that there's not. But Matthew 25, 1 through 13, if you want to go back and read that, it gives a vivid description of what Christ said the end will be like. 
Many churches and denominations are rejecting the clear teachings of this book. Why? Because it offends people. They don't want to be that way. It's old and archaic, and we shouldn't go by it because we have adjusted. We are more, more, more uh, advanced sociologically, and we can now get along with other people, and we should will not adhere to the words of, these, of this book. Denominations are saying that about this book. They don't believe in the, er in the inerrancy of Scripture. Matter of fact, if you go, and I can just name a few here, there are churches that are pro-abortion, that, that actually give money to benefit it. There are churches that, that are right now ordaining, practicing homosexuals to be uh, uh, ministers, and they're pro-gay marriage. Even though this book, listen, and that's probably going to get me banned there, but that's okay. The, even though this book right here says, hey, that's an abomination. Ultimately, what do you think about it? And I'm going to say this. That's taking God's first command, be fruitful and multiply, and say, no, we don't want that. And doing the opposite of what God has called us to, to be here on this earth. And, and you know what? By the, the world said, hey, that's hate speech. You can't say that. There's people that don't believe in the inerrancy of Scripture, don't believe that there's an actual hell, and don't believe that there's a devil. They teach that from their pulpit. That doesn't happen here. Many believe in what I said, universalism. They think that there's many ways to get to God. Uh, there's other ways. Matter of fact, there's a lot of preaching from pulpits that says that all you got to do is be good. If you're good enough, you're going to go to heaven. From pulpits. Preachers are preaching that. So there is, there, and if you look around this world, that is going on right now. Verse 5. Paul says, Remember you not that when I was with you, I told you these things. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of the iniquity doeth already work. Only he who now there we go. letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. He who now restrains, he who holds back, will until he be taken out of the way. Verse 8, and it says this, it says, and then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the Spirit. What is that saying? Okay. The lawless one, the Antichrist, will be revealed when the one who restrains is taken away. Who is the one who restrains? And that, if you read commentaries, some people say, what's the government? The government's going to be, there's going to be an overthrow of government. Lawlessness will prevail. Uh, that's talking more more than that. It's talking about. Uh, I'll go into. I'm not going to tell you all the others. It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is restraining. And who? How's the Holy Spirit doing it? Through His church. The Holy Spirit indwells believers. When every believer is taken off the planet Earth, there is no one here that's going to say, "Here's what the Bible says." Nobody's going to stand here and be a light in the darkness anymore until the 144,000 Jews are sent out. When the Holy Spirit is removed, then evil will have its way. The Holy Spirit is holding things back. He is the restrainer. So that's, that's what we see. So the rapture uh, will occur when God removes his church and evil will have his way. So I've heard, I've had, I, people's asked me, who do you think, Coach Kid, who do you think the Antichrist? Who do you think the Antichrist is? I have no idea. I mean, there's a lot of can good candidates out there, but I don't know. I mean, I really don't know. But, and uh, so, I mean, I don't think as a church, we would, if he comes on the scene, we would be like, that's him. That's the Antichrist. We would know. He says, but they would. it would even be possible to see that even the very elect, we could be deceived, but we're not going to be here. So we're not going to be deceived. But if we were here, we'd be like, that's him. Don't fall for it, guys. 
That's what we would be doing. Now, Luke 17, 26 gives us a little insight. Jesus tells us what it's going to be like. And I'm just going to read just real quick. In Luke 17, uh, verse 26. Caleb's got these quicker than me. It says, and as, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat and they did drink. They married wives. They were given into marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the, and the food came and destroyed them. And the flood came. The food did come, but it was on there before. The flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat and they drink and they bought, they sold, they planted and they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Now, what is that saying? Coach Kid, should we buy guns and get ready, build us a bunker? No. Here's what I'm going to tell you to do. Do exactly as you've been doing, but looking for the coming of the Lord. Because, you know what? They didn't go and build a, you know, Noah built an ark, but you know our ark is in Christ. He is our ark. He's going to, in Him, we are safe. So, so basically, it's business as usual. Business as usual. And it goes on, and it says this, uh, it says in verse 31, 31, it says, In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff is in the house, let him not go down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife. Three, three words there. Remember Lot's wife. If you don't know the story about Lot, Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. The angel came and took them out, grabbed them, another picture of the rapture, grabbed them and saved their lives, but Lot's wife lingered her heart was still with her stuff. So she looked back, and when she looked back, she was turned to a pillar of salt. He's telling us, don't long for your stuff. Don't love earth so much that you're going to miss it. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Well, Lot's wife's treasure, don't give her name, but it was back in Sodom. She wanted to be back in Sodom, so she turned and looked. And when she turned, she was turned to a pillar of salt. So he says that. He goes, look towards heaven. Look for the coming of the Lord. And then, and then it goes on. It says this. Whosoever shall seek, shall seek to save his life shall lose it. Whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. I tell you that in, in that night there shall be two in bed. The one shall be taken and the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together, or by the microwave, uh, and the one shall be taken and the other one left. But none of my kids were here. I was going to say getting a sandwich. They were getting a sandwich, but they're not here. So, uh, well, Emma, she don't want to give me a sandwich. But, uh, so there were two there. One got a sandwich and the other one was left. So, And it says, two men shall be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. And they answered and said unto him, where, Lord? And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is that thither, will the eagles be gathered together? Where do the eagles go? In the air. Eagles could fly higher than most birds. I was looking at 10,000 feet, miles, I don't know, feet above, or miles, they could go miles above. They could go miles above, whereas other uh, the, there's an actual duck that flies across the Himalayas uh, that could fly pretty far. But eagles, they'll be in the air. His church will be gathered in the air. So here, but go back to 1 Thessalonians 4.12 real quick. Or 4.17. 4, 4.17. See, she's quicker. My handwriting doesn't look good, guys. It says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up in, together with them in the clouds to be in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, look at that next verse. Verse 18, one more time. I like this because, Wherefore, comfort ye one another with these words. 
I and I, you can you tell me otherwise, but I think a pre-tribulation rapture is the only one that will fit with this verse right here. Wherefore comfort you one another with these words. Encouragement only makes sense with the pre-tribulation rapture. Because, I mean, think about this. Could you imagine in one of these other views, you're going to go through a judgment that will kill one-third of all mankind. At the end of the tribulation, there will be no economy. Billions and billions of people will be dead. Will will be hit by meteors and comets and all the life sea, life in the sea will be dead. The world will be decimated. Therefore, comfort you one another with these words. See, that don't fit, does it? I don't think so. See, let's go back to 2 Thessalonians. And now I'm going to quit. I gave Kayla a bunch of verses because the rat, I just like, I may go here, I may go here, I may go here, I may go here. But uh, I want her to be ready, but... 2 Thessalonians 9, or chapter 2, verse 9. It goes and it says, we're going to just walk through this some more here. It says, For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day. And I'm not in the right one. If I go to 2 Thessalonians, I was like, that's not, I'm not reading that. That's good. Remember. But that's not what we did. Thanks, Kayla. Look, she's there. I gave her the verses. Uh, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Did you see that? The love of of the truth that they might be saved. I'm going to go through the next two verses. But I want you to hold on to that. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusions that they should not that they should believe a lie, but they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So there's going to be after the church is raptured, God's going to send forth. Let them believe a lie. They're going to believe that. It's called the Great Tribulation. It's actually called Jacob's Trouble. Remember Lot's wife? Luke 21, 34. Uh, in Luke 21, verse 34, and I do have it this time, it says, and Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged, and with, with suffering and drunkenness and cares of this life and so that that day comes upon you unawares. Remember Lot's wife. So that day could come upon you unaware. Don't be overcharged with suffering and drunkenness and the cares of this life. Look at verse 35. For as, as a snare shall it come upon all them that dwell on the face of the earth, the whole earth. Verse 36. Watch you therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. And I've, I've been told this because I'm a, I believe in the pre-tribulation that I... I just want to escape. I'm an escapist. I'm, just, I'm not a, marine, a true Marine. Get down and live through it. Let's go. We're going to fight. We're going to be. I don't think. I think we're going to hope to escape. I don't think you want to stand through the tribulation and live through it. I think. As a matter of fact, it's called a snare here. That's a trap. That's set. God wouldn't set. You know, we experience the. The tribulation of the troubles of this world. The tribulation of the troubles of Satan. And now you're going to experience the wrath of God. No, he's, we're, not, we're not here for his wrath. We are, I believe we are an escapist. It says that you may be counted worthy. Pray always that you may be accounted worthy. How are you worthy? By doing good? No, we're accounted worthy by believing on the Son. Believing on the one who he has sent. That's how we're worthy. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. We're worthy because we're in Him. We can only be accounted because His righteousness was, was given to us. It's in our account. 
So when we go to draw from our bank, his righteousness is there. We had an empty bank account. So we're drawing on his righteousness. So 2 Thessalonians 2.10, and I know I was just there, but 2 Thessalonians 2.10, read that one more time. Uh, Caleb, if you can pull that up. Uh, I've got so many tabs. It says, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, and them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. The love of the truth. See, I try to be as compassionate and as gracious as I can. But I don't want to sacrifice this word right here. Jesus was full of grace and truth. Do you know, I've heard it said that truth without grace is like going to surgery without any anesthesia. That's going to hurt. But they're helping you, right? But that's going to hurt. Grace without truth is like having a bottle of medicine with no medicine in it. Help. You have to have the truth. But we also need to be gracious. We also need to love. Receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. We can't be like Peter and take out our sword and start chopping off ears. Which you see, as a matter of fact, I, I, I follow friends that believe different than me, but they were holding up and they said, way to go in evangelicals. Somebody was holding up and had a list of people that are going to die and go to hell. That's the sign they're holding up. That's not the message that God came to send to the world, even though that is the truth of the, uh, it is in the word, but that's not with love. Love of the truth. But don't give up God's truth so that people are going to feel better about themselves. We should never do that. Now I'm going to hit you real quick. And if, if uh, Kayla wants to pull some things up, six reasons I, I believe in a tribulation rapture. And these will be quick. The first one will probably be the longest, but these will be quick. And I think if we could write these down, that would be good. If not, just remember them because I know some of you remember a lot of good things. But this is this is Daniel writes about the, the 70 weeks. You see, the tribulation focuses on the nation of Israel not and the unbelieving nations, not the church. Daniel chapter 9, verse 25 talks about this. And Daniel 9, 25 talks about Daniel's 70 weeks. Daniel 9 is a prophetic timetable for Israel. Uh, the first 69 weeks, which is 483 83 years, were from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild the temple all the way until, uh, until uh, the Messiah comes. And you know when he came? Matter of fact, 483 years to the exact day was Jesus' triumphal entry on Palm Sundry on the back of, a, on the back of an ass's cult. 483 years to the exact day. The prophetic clock then stopped. There's still seven more years that need to be fulfilled because there's a mystery there. It's called the church. The Old Testament, you won't find the word church in the Old Testament because it's a mystery. It didn't exist. Matter of fact, God told, or Jesus told Peter, I will build my church. <coughs> still in the future. Jesus built his church. And Jesus' church is the indwelled believers of the Holy Spirit that believe in him. That's his bride. And that's from, well, after the crucifixion on. And how long is that going to last? It's by grace. God's mercy is holding on till the last soul be saved. The last soul to be saved. Then... The next seven years will be the tribulation. Daniel 9, or, oh, I'll read this. Now therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. And the street shall be built again and the wall and even 
in troubled times. Okay, go to that next verse real quick. Verse 26. It says, And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations and determined, uh, are determined. Now here's what that's saying. Okay, the Messiah's killed. Jerusalem is, has been destroyed and the temple destroyed. The Jews will encounter hardship during that time. And in 927 it says this. It says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of that week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of the abominations he, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation and the determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So that's the last week. And that is the tribulation week that will occur. God is dealing with Israel up until Jesus was crucified that week. Actually, the, the triumphal entry. And then he started dealing with his church. Then when the church is taken off the scene, he will deal with Israel for seven years. His people. Now, real quick. So that's the final week. And second thing, second reason is if you look in the book of Revelation, the church is missing in the tribulation passages. If you read Genesis or Revelation 1 through 3, church, the church is mentioned 19 times. But in general, or Revelation 4, all the way through 18, during the tribulation time, the church is never mentioned. The church isn't mentioned. So uh, thirdly, the church is not appointed to wrath. Romans 5 9. And I'm going to, uh, Kayla will pull it up. In Romans 5 9, it says this. It says, Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Now, that word from is, you're, you're not going to experience it. You're not going to be in. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 1 10, of course, says that we are delivered. Uh, we've already been through that. Uh, and chapter 4 says that we are called up, we're taken away, we're not going to experience his wrath. First Thessalonians 5.9, if you could pull that up, Caleb. I know I, I have another one on there. First Thessalonians 5.9 says, uh, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation 6.17 says this, and uh, it says, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? No one's going to be able to stand during his wrath. And we're called to stand. So we won't be here. We won't be here during his wrath. When his wrath is pulled out, poured out, it's poured out on the unbelievers and those that have not trusted him. And if you look at God's pattern, another thing, Enoch was taken. He walked with God. He was pulled out. He didn't go through the, the flood. He was taken out. Noah was, you say, well, he went through the flood. No, no, he was above it. He didn't experience the flood. He, he was above He was riding above it. Uh, Lot was pulled out. Uh, the Passover, if you look at that example, the Passover, uh, he came over. And, uh, the, the firstborn, all that didn't have the blood applied, was wiped out. Uh, the, the two spies that were sent in escaped. Rahab and Jericho, they don't experience his wrath. Uh, and you go on and on of the examples, the pattern that he set. Uh, who did experience his wrath? His son. His wrath was poured out on his son on the cross for you and I. So he took our place. He took our wrath. Revelation 3.10 says that we are kept from that hour. Look at here. Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. And uh, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Now, kept from. That means saved out of. That word means saved out of. Not like 
you'll be kept in, in it and not. No, you're going to be saved out of it. Look at verse 13. Well, that, that applies to that church coach kid, but look at verse 13. Verse 13 of the same ch chapter 3. It says, He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So that's for all of us. And, of course, as I've already said, I think because the restrainer being removed from 2 Thessalonians 2 is that. But if you read Scripture, I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 verses here that talk about the rapture being imminent, ready to take place at any moment. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1.7, 1 Corinthians 16.22, Philippians 3.20, uh, Philippians 4.5. Go, go to 1 Corinthians 1.7 real quick. We'll just read that one. And then I'll give you uh, 1 Corinthians 1.7. And I know Kayla, I've given her a bunch of verses I've missed. So that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Go to Philippians 3.20. We'll get one there. And Philippians 3.20, it says... Uh, There we go. Uh, for our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Titus 2.13. And I'm sorry, they're out of order, so Titus 2.13. Real quick, it says, looking for the blessed hope, that blessed hope of the rapture, and the glorious appearing of that great God, the great God and our, Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, Jude 21. There's also Hebrews 9.28, 1 Peter 1.13. Uh, Jude chapter, or, or chapter 1, that's all there is, one chapter. Verse 21. Jude 21, it says, Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. There, and all those scriptures, every single one of them is looking, ready for that to take place. His imminent return. Now here's the thing. If it was any one of those other times, he would have said, okay, once this occurs, you've got seven years. We're supposed to be looking for him to come at any moment in the twinkling of an eye. Imminent return only fits with pre-tribulation because it's not imminent at, the, at that point. It could happen at any, it could happen in seven years or three and a half years. But he says at any moment, church, I ask you, if you're here today, do you know that you're ready to go? Or can you be counted worthy? Have you trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Maybe you just identify with us because you like to come and sit in here. Hey, that's good. I love you all. I do love to come and sit down with you, but I want what you've got if I didn't have it. Because you can know without a shadow of a doubt that you know Jesus is your Lord and Savior. I'm going to, Caleb, if you could play something quietly here. Keep yourselves in the love of God. That's what he tells us to do. Looking for the mercy. His mercy would be that he would pull us out. For that eternal life. His mercy, his wrath is not poured out on us. We may me feel like what we're going through is wrath. It's not. It's not. We're near it. But as we're getting closer, you know, as you, the spiral goes a little faster, we're getting more and more things that are occurring, getting us ready. There's so much I wanted to talk on, but the God didn't give me the liberty. But I do know this. He may one day, if I get another chance to stand for This week, yeah, I could. Am I going to say it is? No, I'm not. It could still be a few years down the road. But I know this. Everything is in order that it looks like it could go right now, this day. When this scripture was written, when Paul wrote, ready for his return, See, the world hasn't even received the gospel yet all around the world. We have now filled the world. Every country has the gospel. We're 
We're waiting on that last soul to be saved. Maybe it's here, they're here today in our very presence. Is it you? I ask you. Here in just a moment, I want to open the altar for us as a church to pray if you want to. You can sit right where you're at, but if you want to come up here and get on the altar and you pray, uh, that's fine. If you need me to pray with you, I'll put my mask on and I'll come to pray with you. Church, I love you. If you've never tr trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, in just a moment, when they come, I, I want you to come up here and, and be saved. Today is the day of salvation. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for each one that's gathered here. Lord, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, obey the Holy Spirit. If he's asking to move, move. Come and pray. each and every one of you. Uh, church, we need to be praying for his country. Uh, we need to be praying for one another. Lift up one another as we're going through. I mean, there's some here that can't go to work uh, because of the sickness that's going around. There's some here that I, my life has been changed totally with school and I can't remember what it was like to go back to school. I mean, it's when you lose kids for the summer, it's hard to get them back. And they're ready to go, but I, we lost them for the summer, then the summer again, you know. So uh, the kids of uh, Brother John was saying they've probably fallen behind. Uh, so we need to pray for pray for one another. Uh, Lord knows what he's doing. Uh, I don't think it's an accident. He allowed it to happen. So let's, let's grow closer to him and, and lean on him during this time. A lot more people have been thinking on him, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. Uh, God's word say, says, <clears throat> uh, everyone that hath breath, praise the Lord. And we're going to close out on three, if you would, stand where you're at. Uh, and as you're standing, you have breath, which we do. Uh, that's why we're saving it here. We're going to say praise the Lord on three. One, two, three. Praise, praise the Lord. Lord. You're dismissed. Uh, usually we shake hands and love on each other, but.